Ah, uh, this game. <laughs> you know, out of all my... Hmm, I could have sworn it was earlier than that. Less than a year of playing Helldivers, I would have never thought that I would see the day when I could sit down at a cafeteria and overhear some people on the other table talking about this obscure game from 2015. I mean, I still haven't seen that day because they're not talking about it, they're talking about its sequel. What can I say? Helldivers 2, it gets the views. Nice. Greetings everyone, it is I, the totally not becoming a Helldivers channel guy. As with all media, Helldivers is a series, and it's got some lore. Now, as a fan of the first game, and its ridiculous story, I was pleasantly surprised at just how faithful the second game remained to its predecessor. Oftentimes, with sequels like these, since the developers are much more experienced and they actually start to take things a little bit more seriously, the unfortunate outcome is that they tend to also rewrite much of the story through retcons and conflicting plot points. The FNAF series comes to mind. I mean, this studio was releasing a live service PvE four player co op shooter that was a sequel to their previous game, which had completely different gameplay that came out all the way back in 2015. That kind of makes you think of something else. However, this outcome shouldn't really surprise me, being that the two games share the same game director and much of the senior staff, but basically the same people made both games. So I will admit, I was worried there for a little bit when the two factions were revealed were called the Automatons and the Terminids and no sign of the Illuminate anywhere. I just thought that these two were to replace the generic sounding cyborgs and bugs. Fortunately, the Terminids are the bugs from the first game, and the in-universe reason for them being different now is due to 100 years of rapid evolution and genetic modification. And looking at the automatons, I mean, they share the same symbol. They're both red-looking dudes with very retro Soviet militaristic style. They're both described as socialist. The deputy game director did say in an interview that the automatons were and I quote, not the cyborgs. And then right after that, he proceeded to say that they were definitely, totally, they definitely had nothing to do with them whatsoever. So, uh, yeah. And as for the Illuminate, October 26th. Now, I like to think of myself as <laughs> the guy to go for all things Helldiver's lore. Don't actually come to me for that. I'm not going to be able to help you. And as that guy, after hearing the dialogue and reading the item descriptions and watching the proper trustable news sources, I have found very few discrepancies in the universe between the two games. And most of these discrepancies, to be fair, could be easily explained, such as the substance that the bugs break down into in the first game is called oil, but in the second game it has a name, E710, which oil is a very broad term. Vegetable oil isn't the same as motor oil, so this fuel is just, you know, one type of oil. However, there is one very noticeable discrepancy, so much so that I immediately noticed it like a few minutes into the second game. I think the dilemma on our hands is a power scaling issue. Or is it? But we'll get to that later. And by later, I mean like right now. <laughs> Section 1. The Scales of War. So for this video, I'm going off the assumption that most of you are coming from the second game and haven't played the first. Although I highly recommend that you get it when it goes on sale for like $5. We all know how the mission select for the second game works. You go into the galaxy map, pick a planet to play on, select the difficulty, or in my case, once you unlock level 9, you just leave it there. On those planets, you can see regions assigned to you, as well as ongoing missions from other players you can join. And in those regions are 1-3 to three missions, depending on the difficulty, that make up an operation. And once you finish that operation, then the game adds some score to the progress of whatever particular goal is on that planet. In Helldivers 1, however, this feature is is slightly different. Basically, right after the tutorial, the game says, all right, so here are your 15 assigned planets. Your job is to conquer them all. Don't worry about getting them all. We just need to control enough planets to consider the sector secure. So uh, yeah, good luck and have fun. You can kind of see how this is a little bit different as instead of one to four hell divers per region, it's one to four hell divers per planet. But I have a theory. I know what you're thinking. One of these days, you're going to hear that phrase spoken by his lips for the last time. And that day, that day is rapidly approaching like a storm. The mission structure is all pretty much the same between the two games. The 15 differently sized planets represent the 15 difficulties in the first game and is how you choose them. And just to put things into perspective, difficulty 12 in the first game is Helldive difficulty, which is equivalent to difficulty 9 in the second game, and that used to be the highest until three more were added a couple years after launch. 
There are also a couple more planets that may appear for you to select, those being the boss fights, yes this game does have those, and the capital assault slash capital defense planets, and I'll talk more about those later. So, do we have a difference in power here? How come one Helldiver in the first Galactic War can take an entire planet, but 100 years later it takes hundreds of thousands of Helldivers just to make a tiny little impact in one planetary campaign? because keep in mind every time we respawn that it's canonically a new Helldiver being sent into the meat grinder. What happened to the Helldivers? Has the military gone soft? Are the Helldivers 1 Helldivers on a low 5B level on the power scaling tier? Well, the Helldivers 2 Helldivers on a measly level 6C? Or however the frick you stupid nerds rank these things? Well, after putting many hours in both games, it doesn't really seem to be much of a difference. I did replay the tutorial missions for both games, and the basic training for them seemed to be fairly similar. Both see recruits conducting live fire exercises, practicing calling down stratagems, and being pitted against enemies that will not hesitate to kill the recruits. I guess the only big differences is that the first game lets you play with hell bombs in the tutorial, that's not really anything. And when actually playing missions, all of the weapons and the stratagems are very similar in effectiveness. It seems the effectiveness between the Helldivers 1 Helldivers and Helldivers 2 Helldivers is pretty negligent. If anything, the Helldivers 2 Helldivers would be just stronger due to technological progress and the fact that they can actually take more than two hits before becoming incapacitated. Clearly not a power scaling issue, it's actually a war scaling non-issue. Hear me out. So the size of the maps the missions take place on in Helldivers 1 is pretty comparable, maybe even a little bit smaller to the size of them in the second game. The objectives are quite similar, although in the first game there are no optional objectives, just a bunch of smaller randomly pre-generated missions instead of one big one spread throughout the map. In the second game you do one to three missions, again depending on the difficulty to liberate a small region, one among thousands across the planet. In the first game you do one to three missions, also depending on the difficulty, of pretty much the same sized missions to liberate an entire planet, one among thousands in that entire sector. So you're actually doing a pretty equal amount of fighting in both games, but in the first game you're securing a much larger area for it. One thing I noticed very quickly when I initially started playing Helldivers 1 is how empty the planets felt. And I don't mean that in a bad way in that the missions were boring and didn't have anything to do, but the observation of the complete lack of human civilization stuck with me in the back of my mind throughout the entire course of me playing that game. In the second game, you have all sorts of fun things to discover in the maps. You can see houses the colonists have lived in before the war was still up. There's infrastructure like radio towers spread everywhere. There are also a bunch of little enemy bases or nests or other things that they have built that you can go and destroy. The first game had maybe like a bunker here, a truth tower there. There was also a missile silo objective, but it was a much smaller one. And any enemy bases were not really bases. They kind of felt like temporary encampments more than anything. These maps didn't really feel like human colonies. They were more so just outposts than anything. And as a matter of fact, I think that's exactly what they are. A couple of decades after faster and light travel is invented is when Helldivers 1 takes place in the year 2084, which is quite literally 1984 plus 100. Assuming that humanity in this universe has not experienced the imminent population decline our own seems to be heading towards, it is still not possible out of the estimated millions of potentially habitable planets in our galaxy for humans to create self-sufficient colonies on every single one. When I first saw how many worlds this war would be taking place on, I assumed the developers were leaning into that Warhammer-esque absurdity, you know, with humanity spanning thousands of worlds and constant warfare with many different alien species. But instead of 40,000 years from now, it's, um, exactly 60 from, like, from, like, right now. Which, to be fair, that's probably the reason, but this is my lore video, so I'm gonna go with what I think. These are not colonies like in the second game, they are actually military outposts and the survivors you rescue on the survival missions are the Super Earth Armed Forces personnel that are stationed there. The Federation of Super Earth and its enemies are actually spread very thinly throughout the galaxy in the First Galactic War. There are not enough soldiers on either side to support very large battles, so most of the fighting is done on a much smaller strategic scale at key locations located on the planets. Since the outposts are currently the only thing worth of any note on any of these worlds, securing them is considered securing the entire planet, 
and then we move on to the next assigned planet that replaces that one. Think of it as sort of a galactic island hopping campaign. See so you guys, look, it's, it's a toy 4. I still do map games on this channel. Helldivers is not completely taking over. Look, it, it's Funny Elf Landon. You guys like Funny Elf Landon, right? Right? I'm not bandwagoning, you're bandwagoning. Was it considered bandwagoning if I played the first game before this one came out? And I technically also did uploaded Helldivers video before the second game as well. Think of it as a little Easter egg hunt, see if you can go find it. And then when you do find it, uh, don't worry about the context. Anyways, both countries need to conquer little bits of land to just secure supply lines until they reach the other's homeland, or home planet in this case. However, instead of the Pacific looking like this, it looks more like this. Let's say the US conquer liberates these islands here, then that whole area can be considered secure for them to move on to the next group of islands. Sure, there may still be some Japanese forces occupying some of these islands, but they pose no threat now that they have been completely cut off. The only real option they have is to hope that the US is pushed back to where they can be rescued, or that they can find sustainable food and water sources. Otherwise, they'll have no choice but to surrender, or dying i guess is always an option super earth and her enemies are in a constant state of trying to swiftly outmaneuver each other with their fleets in order to secure enough planets to give themselves the upper hand and push to the next sector a concept that i find really fascinating and i'm really proud that hi came up with it or this was arrowhead's intent the entire time and that just completely flew over my head that's that's always a possibility anyways that explains how humanity could have fought on so many different planets not too far in the future but now the question is where the heck did they all go? Part 2. Habitability. So the war in the first game was fought on hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of planets. And the number of planets in the second game is exactly 253, including Super Earth and Mars. And yes, I did start to count these and I got like halfway until I realized someone probably already did it on the wiki. And they did. The in-game lore indicates that after the first galactic war, the Super Earth government started a major colonization project, now made possible at such scales due to the fuel acquired from the Terminid. So what happened? Did the Federation just ignore these planets? Actually, yes they did. And it all comes down to one word. Habitability. Now, use the Lars players out there. You probably have a good idea of what I'm getting at. Do you guys know about Fermi's Paradox? <laughs> Basically, it's the idea that the universe, or at the very least, our own galaxy, is so vast that there is no way we haven't made contact with alien life yet. Now, I'm not focusing on the paradox itself, but the other things it entails, such as the idea that there are millions of habitable worlds that, while not quite containing intelligence, at least support advanced life forms like these plants or whatever those creatures were. Now, since these planets are able to sustain life, humans should be able to live there, right? Well, not exactly. Humans, we evolved on Earth. We are adapted to living on Earth's environment, and we will have the easiest time living here than anywhere else. No matter where we go, any other planet we live on will have less than perfect conditions for specifically human life, even if it has its own life that thrive there. Any number of things can cause this, like if the nitrogen makeup in the atmosphere is like 2% off or something, I don't know, I'm not an expert in this field, but you get what I'm saying. Even though these planets have life on them, it still is life that evolved completely separate from ours to, you know, live on that specific planet. My theory is that, although humans can live on these planets in small military outposts, the Federation has deemed the cost of housing entire colonies made up of millions of people on most planets would be far too great, at least with the technology and resources they had at the time. It could also be that the human population just isn't large enough to colonize all of these planets, and that the ones you see in the second game are actually just planets determined to be the most suitable for human life. Now, it may not make that much sense as these planets can range from permadark death forests to literal hell, but as I said, any number of factors could have influenced their decision. It is also worth noting that by the time the second game occurs, humans are at least capable of terraforming Mars enough to have standing water and bushes growing. Although I am suggesting that, at least for the vast majority of planets in Helldivers 1, the Federation didn't have the capability or the desire to colonize them. However, major colonies did actually exist in the first game. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is that large-scale battles on single planets that thousands of Helldivers partake in, just like in Helldivers 2, actually do exist in the first game in the form of capital defense events and assaults on enemy homeworlds. So I should probably mention that in Helldivers 1 you can actually win the Galactic War, 
as a matter of fact we literally just did, and then everything resets. This happens in a cycle that lasts about a month to a month and a half. However, you can also lose the war if one of the three enemy factions pushes the community all the way back to Super Earth, and then we lose that defense event. Now, I'm going to assume that the text you get from losing the war that says humanity just picks another planet to move to and calls that the new Super Earth so we can start the war all over again is not canon. But what you should get from this is that you can lose the war and you do that by losing sectors. And the way you lose sectors is if the enemy successfully takes the capital city of that sector, which that happens if the community doesn't get enough score by doing the missions on the planet to win that event during the 2 hour and 20 minute time limit. We then lose that sector whenever we lose the planet, and since the enemy has just made a major breakthrough, they start a blitz campaign and then they immediately move on to the next capital city of the next sector. So it is possible to lose the war in a very short amount of time. The point I'm trying to make of all of this though is that these planets do have large groups of people living on them and even full-blown cities as a fifth map type you get to play on only in these events. These capital planets are the linchpin of all of the Federation's operations in that sector. Going back to my Pacific Theater analogy, they're kind of like certain key locations such as Singapore and Manila. These cities were vital to the war effort because they come complete with dockyards and naval bases to maintain repair ships, fuel silos, major supply hubs, and whenever the crews of ships were rotated out, they could have stayed there before it was their turn again. These cities actually had the infrastructure to support a war unlike the tiny little islands. The loss of these would have been a major blow to the whole region, just like in Helldivers 1. In Helldivers 2, however, there are a lot more planets, actually every single one you can see on the map, that had major colonies and cities on them, and they could actually support the war effort on their own. So just losing one of them isn't going to lose you the entire sector because there are four more just like it. The warfare is a lot more static in the second game because they aren't completely reliant on a few select major planets. The planets in Helldivers 2 are best comparable to the capital planets of Helldivers 1, with them being the ones best able to support human life and I bet many of them are actually the same exact planets. This is further supported by the fact that Cyberstan, the cyborg homeworld from the first game, is present in the second game as a world that humans live on, while the other two homeworlds are not. The cyborgs were humans after all, who seceded from Super Earth. It makes sense that the cyborgs would pick a homeworld that humans can live and thrive on, because they are human. The Squith and the Terminans, on the other hand, are entirely different species that evolved completely separately from us. Their homeworlds were not suitable for humans to have been living on by the year 2184. Squabai Shrine, the Illuminate homeworld, has some weird purple thing going on with the atmosphere, probably not healthy for a colonist to breathe in their entire life. And I assume the Terminids, you know, a galaxy-spanning hive species, have probably completely integrated Kepler Prime over the years into their hive, turning it into a world perfectly suitable for their species and only their species. So all of this so far was my attempt to explain this inconsistency between the games, and if what I'm theorizing is accurate, what does this indicate for the second game? I believe that this doctrine of swift warfare would lead to Super Earth making their biggest mistake. After all, in the same interview I mentioned earlier, the deputy game director said that as the war progresses, we will see the Federation dig themselves into deeper and deeper holes. As Super Earth, arrogant as it is, digs itself into deeper and deeper problems. And I think that has already started. Third chapter, an irresponsible government. <clears throat> Remember near the beginning of the video I mentioned how the first game tells you that conquering all the planets is unnecessary in order to win the war? Did they keep that mindset after the war? Think about it. Their homeworlds were conquered, each of the three enemy factions were subjugated, and what remained of them was left scattered across small planets they're not even adapted to living on in the first place. Why would Super Earth waste all of those resources on cleanup duty when the remnants are going to die off anyways? In a final look back on World War II, you may have heard the stories of the Japanese holdouts, individuals who were stranded on remote islands that believed the war was still ongoing many years after it had already been ended, some even into the 70s. And I think this is how the second game happened. The entire terminated race was taken to be used as livestock for their fuel that they break down into. It makes sense for the Federation to run up cleanup duty on them, 
because it would have been worth the costs. The entire northeastern region of the galaxy, after it had been settled, would produce a very rich fuel-based economy, providing the vital E-710 to the rest of humanity, like the space version of Pennsylvania. Humanity was supposed to domesticate the Terminids, but clearly that did not happen. Instead, we opted to conduct genetic engineering in order for them to produce fuel more efficiently, and thus, after years of warfare, butchering, and experimentation, <laughs> the fear of humans has been ingrained into the very psyche of the Terminids, so they evolved to be fearful and to resort to their instinctual violence whenever encountering their most dangerous predator. In the former cyborg region of space, the raw resources and industrial base of their nation, and with the help of the recently enslaved cyborgs, would be adopted to provide the manufacturing power Super Earth needed to establish its colonies, like the Space Midwest. The remaining cyborgs were left scattered across the region as they were deemed as no longer a threat to democracy. They couldn't help but watch as their fellow comrades in Cyberstan were worked to death in the mines that they were subjected to. Stuck on alien planets they were not adapted to live on and struggling to collect the needed sustenance to maintain their failing flesh, they had no other choice but to see the ultimate end goal of their society. Completely casting off their biological physique, they had fully made the transition to fully autonomous machines. The only thing left of their human form, both physical and spiritual, was their intelligence and the seething hatred of Super Earth. As for the Squith, well, their entire civilization is in shambles. Sure, they were allowed to keep their planet, but in the peace treaty, they had been forced to surrender all of their technology and weapons to the humans. Thousands of years of knowledge they had worked so hard to acquire, gone in an instant. They had initially tried to make friends with the humans, they even shared some of their knowledge with them, but were quickly backstabbed due to human pride. The southern half of the galaxy would become a bastion for human technological process and specialized manufacturing, like a space Silicon Valley. The Illuminate realized the hard way that the universe was as not as kind as they thought. Instead of being a bright prairie, it was more like a dark, um, uh, dark, uh, ch -ch 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 I can't think of anything. No, scattered and decentralized throughout the galaxy, and the entire Squith race would go into hiding, hoping that after so many years, the humans would simply forget that they were part of their history. The Illuminate are a very intelligent group of beings who will recover. With this newfound tranquility completely unbothered by humans, they will fix their problems and rebuild in the shadows as they wait for the perfect opportunity to strike back and take their revenge. Oh hey, would you look at that?